Dear friends, we, we live in a very um, interconnected world. Um, on Saturday, I was keynote speaker in Indianapolis for a group called the Minorities in Agriculture and Natural Resources uh, Organization. I used to be a member of that organization, advised it while I was uh, teaching, uh, while I was at Illinois. And so we were with John Deere, they all sponsored it, Eli Lilly, they were sponsors of this event. 850 young minds. Uh, mainly minority, but also a lot of um, I saw a lot of Asian students that were also international there, 850 of them with practitioners as well, uh, trying to talk to them about our interdependence. So if you see me straying into that, it's because it's still on my mind, um, how connected we are. We live in this global village, we're all connected now. When weather, weather patterns change, it affects all of us. In, I, I had an industry organization, so we say pollutants are transboundary. You know, they go across. Carbon does not stay in the U.S., or if it is produced in China, it still comes here. If you produce carbon, it goes across. So it is transboundary, so it, it affects all of us. And therefore, we have a common responsibility to deal, to help all of us transition to a low carbon economy. You know, when I was studying here, Africa was a footnote, but today it's part of the strategic plan of the United States for global security. Because when those nations fail, and they don't have hope, there will be problems. It so happens that they're the lowest emitters of carbon dioxide, 3% or less. But guess what? Every one of the studies from IPCC to the best think tanks and MIT says, if global warming really happens, is they will pay the highest price. Farm community, you are some of the, the most uh, conscientious people I have met, because I spent a good part of my life in the United States with you. I know you care about justice. So today, the people in the University of Colorado talk about carbon justice and climate justice. Why should those who pollute the least suffer the most? That's not a fair world. In the transitions we've had, industrial revolution and all of that, it made us more carbon dependent. Our production systems, whether in agriculture or elsewhere, heavily carbon dependent. So I feel very impressed coming here to a group of you discussing a 2025 scenario. Your contribution, your contribution as part of the answers and solutions to the low carbon world. For me, this is important because then I use it now in Europe and elsewhere to say I met a group in the United States that in fact is looking at this as to how they become part of the solution. The United States is ready to be part of looking for solutions, not preaching to anybody, but saying, come, we want to do business with you, but in a sustainable way as well. And you have solutions. You have solutions the world needs today. We need the leadership of the United States in the climate change discussion but also looking at this as an opportunity for transformation. Transformation to a low carbon economy, solutions you have that the rest of the world cannot even dream of having because we don't have the capital to invest in the R&D. Because this is the only planet we have. It belongs to all of us. If you, if you the, in the United States don't play ball, the Chinese will not. You know, in China last year, we were having a discussion and somebody said, ah, China is the largest producer of carbon this year. They're the biggest polluter. And quickly the, the person was corrected, yes, this year, but others have been polluting for 150 years. Recently they said to the Chinese, oh well, we, it's, we, we call it in the negotiations common but differentiated responsibilities. We are not all equal, so we, we have to take different responsibilities, but with a common goal. So somebody said, well, you have to pay for emissions. They said, well, let's look at it this way. For over one decade, the Chinese have been producing cheap products, and so in all the analysis, IMF, everybody says non-inflationary continuous expansion for 15 years. So the Chinese said, okay, but who should pay for the emissions? Is it us who produce or the end user of our products? You see how complicated these discussions become? We don't want to do finger pointing. This is not the time for finger pointing. That's why we appreciate the work Tim Worth is doing. He's helping many of us come around the table. Say, let's not politicize the debate. Let's focus on the real issues. People need technologies. <coughs> Farmers around the world need technologies to be more productive, but if the technologies are clean technologies, they will adopt it. But what incentives do we give them? What financing do we put on the table? Because we still need to feed the world. There's, most of the world is hungry, and thanks to you, you feed probably 30% of the world still.
So how do we make you part of the solution? And we really applaud the work that he and these people are doing. I've been with him in China, by the way, and we face some very tough questions there together. So we're becoming a tag team here. I bring the developing country perspective. He comes with some of the American solution, but then we're credible together. Um, so we really applaud what he's doing. I took up the mantra now for the UN to look at energy issues for very selfish reason. I, I was born in a country that was ranked last year the poorest in the world, but for the past 15 years, always for 10 of those 15 years, the, the, the poorest. Um, I went to a university for my undergraduate where we used to st study with candlelight sometimes, 27 years ago. We walk three miles down to the river to get water because there's no power to pump the water up the tank. So you wash and come back, you're sweaty by the time you get back. So I know what lack of power means, what lack of energy means in a community. I live in the first world now, one of the best capitals in the world, in Vienna, Austria. But I have to go home on holidays. My mom and relatives are still there, some of them in the village. We face this every day. Energy, lack of energy is related to poverty. If you don't have a power source, how can you talk about agribusiness? How can you talk about elevating grain if there's no power to drive it? I preach around the world about agribusiness. And people say, well, why agribusiness? We want to talk about agriculture. I say, what I learned in the United States is that agriculture is not just for fun. It's a business. You need the input supply side. They have to make money there. And you need the off farm, from farm to table, as we used to, to preach in those days or teach in the classroom. So it is a business. We have to teach the rest of the world about this supply chain, especially farm to table. Thanks to you, many jobs are created in Frito-Lay, in Cargill, and in other places. This is the message I take along. And he heard me today say to the World Bank, stop talking about poverty alleviation to Africans. Talk about wealth creation. Talk about agribusiness. That's how America changed. That's how Europe changed. That's what the Chinese are doing today as well. Um, we're doing some studies now with IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute here, about the impact of supermarkets on the Chinese agricultural system and the Indian agricultural system. It's remarkable how fast they're changing, but they're learning from the rest of the world. For me, these are the solutions, and a lot of it they've learned from the United States. You're still the beacon of hope for the world. You have a role. We hope you play that role, and we hope we learn from you.